What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Zach Abraham, the Principal and Chief Investment Officer of Bulwark Capital Management and the host of the Know Your Risk radio program that broadcasts across most of the West Coast and which is available on any major podcast platform. Zach and I spend the first hour of our conversation discussing his approach to investing, where he thinks we are in the economic cycle, and why he believes that we continue to see a disconnect between underlying economic fundamentals and asset prices. In the second hour, Zach and I reflect on the economic, political, and cultural changes that we've experienced in our lives, how these changes reflect and are reflected in some of the policy choices that have led us to this point in developed countries, how these changes affect his economic outlook, and how they inform his philosophy as an investor, a parent, and a citizen. You can access that part of the conversation at hiddenforces.io slash subscribe by joining our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. Lastly, because this conversation deals with investing, I want to make absolutely clear that nothing I say on this episode can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this informative and entertaining conversation with my friend, Zach Abraham. Zach Abraham, welcome to Hidden Forces. Man, great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great having you on, man. So is this where you record your radio show from? Yeah, this is the den. I call this the COVID bunker. I used to do the trip up to Seattle, so 45 minute trip. And I'd go do it in the um, you know, in the in the proper radio studio. And if you see, you can probably look over my left shoulder here and see that's not art. It's not modern art there. See a little black strip. We had to turn this into a sound studio during the uh during the COVID lockdown. So I liked the formality of going to the studio. I really did. And now I would never go back. You know what I mean? You get used Mm. to those shortcuts and they're hard to go back on. So yeah, now I just record it all here and get to be in front of the screens and record at the same time, which can be very distracting at times, but uh, certainly more convenient. You know, people, the audience knows this. They're probably sick of hearing how often I say that I miss in-person recordings and I miss doing them in New York City because of that. Uh, Where I live, in fact, I found out that Andy Constant and I live close to each other. So maybe one day he'll come to my studio here and we'll do a recording. But like pretty much, you know, I don't don't really know who else lives in this area. So we're kind of very far away from everybody else. And I have been considering more and more taking the two and a half hour trip to New York just to do recordings. I'm actually, I think I'm going to schedule one at the end of December to do it because in person is so much better than remote, as convenient as it is. Yeah, they, I don't think that you can replicate. I, I only had a few in-persons, you know, Tobias Carlisle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, I had him in person in the studio. Chase Taylor, my head of research, he wasn't my head of research at that time, but uh, had him in the studio. Didn't get to do a lot of in-persons just because we're up here in Seattle, right? Yeah. But it is, man, it is nice. There's that natural go back, you know, there's that natural back and forth, that chemistry you get that I think Zoom obviously makes it a lot better you know, than just doing it over the phone or something like that. But yeah, you can't, you know, I think we Dude, all know it's that. totally different. So listen, let's, I want to make sure that we also move along in a professional way in this conversation, because you and I talk all the time. So I think that's going to make it also fun. But also I want to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. So before we get into anything else, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? You are both the host of a radio program, the Know Your Risk Radio. You could tell us where that's broadcast, which is also a podcast. And you also are the chief investment officer for Bulwark Capital Management, which is an investment management company. 
And I think you also have some kind of separate fund associated with that that you actively manage. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do, et cetera. Yeah, we have a sleeve in it that is just for accredited investors that we just recently launched, but we're an RIA. We manage about 800 million, give or take, right between 750 and 800 million bucks right now, based out of Tacoma, Washington. So just south of Seattle for those about 45 minutes south of Seattle. I always kind of say it's like the New Jersey to New York, right? And we got about 16 employees and um, we started doing a radio show. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it. We started doing a radio show seven or eight years ago, just a short kind of weekend radio show on one station up in Seattle, both to fill time and then also for marketing purposes. And I, I was very skeptical on the marketing side and we got approached by the radio station and I said, yeah, we'll, we'll I'd be interested in doing a show, but I'm not going to do it in like a um, infomercial, right? I'm not going to do it like an infomercial. I want to do it like a real show. And they warned me against that and said, look, you won't generate any calls or whatever. And I said, look, I don't want to be another space filler. So we're going to try to do it our way. If it works, it works. And it does. If it doesn't, then, you know, whatever, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And, you know, by the by the grace of God and the kindness of the people up here, the show kind of took off. And now we're... Uh, on two different stations in Seattle and Portland and in Phoenix. And then we're broadcast via Phoenix all throughout Southern California too. So pretty much covering the West coast. And then we podcast that out and uh, do a one hour show kind of summarizing what's going on that week and then do an interview. We've interviewed you a couple of times, just people that I think are smart and thoughtful and our biggest thing. And it's probably why I gravitated to hidden forces was we have a saying here, which is we don't want to, we don't want to be dealing with show ponies. We like workhorses. Mm. And I've had that conversation <laughs> a lot. And the podcast is spread. We're nowhere near as big as Hidden Forces, but I'm proud to say we, I think we achieved number 116 in the world for business and finance podcasts. Mm. Congratulations. Um, yeah, we're moving up the, <laughs> moving up the ladder, man. And uh, yeah, so here we are and yeah, just trying to survive these markets. Did you ever imagine that you would find yourself in this position today? managing no. so much money and even doing this? I mean, did you know, when did you discover that you had a desire or a knack for finance? So I kind of came by it, honestly. My father and grandfather started a, I mean, it's funny to say it now, my, they started a uh, broker dealer, a B&D, BD in 83. So I was one year old. So I literally had a playpen in a brokerage firm. And then what they specialized in was you know, startup and junior natural resource and mining companies. It was like the crypto of the time, right? And anybody that's dealt with OTC natural resource companies knows what I'm talking about. And so I was just fascinated from a very early age by listening to, you know, my dad talk about Warren Buffett, just the idea of buying. And I remember the first thing that really grabbed my attention, the idea of buying something that everybody had left for dead and finding value in it and proving everybody wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish there wasn't the proving everybody wrong part, but that's just kind of in my nature. I'm a competitor. And it was intellectually fascinating to me. It was just very attractive. And I was just always pulled that way to the point where I loved football. I loved finance. I wanted to go to the NFL. And my backup plan was managing money. And I maxed out at five nine, two hundred pounds, so the NFL was sort of off the table, and um, <laughs> that was that was the only route left. And then came into the workforce right around two thousand five, just in time for the fireworks, which was a baptism by fire. It's a funny story actually. So I, I got hired by Russell Investments right out of college, you know, just a, as a scrapper job, trying to work my way up, and then. The job cuts, the layoffs started happening as a precursor to the financial crisis. I don't think people realize it then. The tremors were shaking through the system in late 2007. So you graduated college when? You said you entered the workforce 05. in 2005? 2005, got it. Yeah. And then came right out and then got that job and then got laid off. My wife also worked at Russell Investments at the time on the hedge fund team that went under. And so she got laid off. We got laid off within like four months of each other. You guys met at the same company? We actually met when we were nine and 10 years old because our mothers worked at that company. So our whole world revolves around finance. Now we run the firm together. We started it. So I didn't know that. I didn't know you, you, you ran the firm with your wife, really? Yeah. She and I started it. She's technically the majority owner. Wow. She's the brain trust. She's got her MBA from the University of Washington. She's a That was my best sales job ever was, was getting her to- Talk about a <laughs> tight-knit family. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it comes with its challenges, comes with its challenges. She's not involved day to day anymore. We got three little ones and she's trying to stay sane, running them around, but you know, plans our company functions, handles our payroll, all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, so I was sitting there in 2008 you remember this well, young guy, you know, just married, been married about a year and a half. I needed to find some work. Only place in finance was a financial advisor job because you don't cost them anything. You're just upside, right? Mm. You know, as a young guy starting up in finance at that time, nobody was hiring. You know, just forget about it. So I took a financial advisor job and my first day on the job was September 15th, 2008, the day Lehman Brothers failed. Wow. Yeah. That was my first day. Did you I any worked on that day or just oh, blew, no, blew up to I, CNBC like everybody else? Well, I'm just watching the guys running around the office, freaking out, you know, and kind of giving me a look like I'm Jonah, you know, like we got to throw this cat overboard, right? Like the minute he walks through the door, this is all hitting the fan. And the funny thing was I was managing some money on the side at that point, a little bit in retrospect, looking back, tiny amount. And I was all bared up on housing, but I was so young in my career. I didn't know how to express the trade. And even though I was bared up in housing in my investment accounts, I purchased a home in the summer of 2006, which I still can't really square, but just being mm-hmm. young, you know, it wasn't going to happen to me. Right. Mm-hmm. So we killed it on the investment side, but I got buried in my house. Well, it was a good hedge if things went sour on your on the investment side, maybe if you yeah, had the wrong, you the wrong framework. Well, that kind of speaks to the point about risk management and how to manage a whole spectrum of likelihoods and assign probabilities to them. What is your approach to investing? What is your investment philosophy, if you could uh, describe it? Yeah. So name of the show is Know Your Risk Radio. And the whole thought behind Bulwark, right? Name of the company, Bulwark. The whole thought behind Bulwark was, I was shocked when I got into the retail investment world and realized that everybody was just slapping people into these computerized models and charging them an admission fee, you know, to, to ride the ride especially in lieu of, you know, the emergence of Vanguard and so many of these other things that if buy and hold your approach in super diversified pools of asset, then just go ride Vanguard. You know what I mean? It didn't really make any sense to me. And so our whole idea with Bulwark was to bring an active hedge fund like process to retail investors and really help them manage risk, which was especially a big deal in the last 15 years, because you know, when you look at historic retirement portfolio returns, so much of that income and stability was provided via fixed income. And, you know, you look at the averages of that fixed income portfolio. If, for instance, if you were a retail investor living in a 60-40 portfolio for the last, you know, 30 years, up until 05, 06, 07, when they started cutting rates, you know, that fixed income portfolio side of it was kicking off six and a half percent annually. That was kind of the average. And once you kind of study that- and you know, inflation was low. Right. Inflation had been persistently low, yeah. Right. So you could basically live off of the, the interest being thrown off the fixed income and just let the stock side of it ride. It was this beautiful marriage. And no real concerns at that time about default risk. I mean, default risk. I mean, I don't mean technical default risk. I mean, even you know having to use the money printer- to cover persistent government deficits. Yeah, right. That was before anybody even, you know- Before QE, remember, before any of that. Oh, remember we were, you think about in the late 90s when we were having a panic attack because deficits were what, 150 billion or Early something Early like 90s that. when it was $4 yeah. trillion, dollars, when the national yeah. debt was $4 trillion dollars and George H.W. Bush ran off of that and, and yeah. Ross Perot was also making a big deal of it. Even the Democrats were concerned about deficits at that time. I mean, Bush, remember Clinton made a big deal out of the fact that he ran a surplus in 1999-2000. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you think about- I mean, about- Greenspan was worried that he wouldn't be able to conduct monetary policy because he wouldn't have the policy space because we were the government would be running persistent surpluses, which is wild. <laughs> Talk about a thing to worry about, right? And just the complete infl- it's complete reversal from, from where we were just 24 years ago. And you know, I know there's probably some listeners out there. Well, 24 years is a long time. Well, not if you lived it. It just seems like yesterday, you know. So we were, I was just looking at this setup and looking at the world 08, 09. First of all, you know, I'm an investment addict and always have been. So I've never considered being a passive manager, but also just think that there's real value there. I, I nobody will ever convince me. And people are like, oh, yeah, you might underperform the market. Yeah, we might underperform the market for a period of time, but we've got a pretty good track record. And our goal for our clients basically is this if we can capture you 80 to 90% of market upside and mute out, 55, 65% of the downside. I think we're doing a really good job. And we've held true to that, actually a little bit better than that. 
and really smooth things out for our clients and, you know, just trying to protect them against, it's just a tough, the other issue you have, or I think that you should have in this environment as a fiduciary is there are so many things outside of historical bounds, right? So just protecting our clients from that and trying to really deliver value. And that's kind of the, like I said, you asked for investment philosophy, but it's kind of baked into the company, which is, you know, be fundamentally sound, be able to generate positive returns in any market and just manage risk, manage risk at the end of the day. And, and I think that that term really gets misunderstood. And I always go back to what Buffett says, right? The three rules of managing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. And rules two and three are C rule number one. And people are like, yeah, you can't lose clients money. And I'm like, I think you're misunderstanding what he means. It's an arbitrage, in my opinion, it's an arbitrage on performance, meaning the less you lose in downswings, the better your long-term performance is. Mm -hmm. It's just the way the math works. So that's the philosophy in a nutshell. Yeah. To your point about passive and index funds, and they've been really great places for people to be invested in. It's been a, it's been a great performer, very low management fees. But the irony of all of that is that you need active in order to have passive. Right. You know, like that's where the intelligence comes from. And without right. it, you would just have flows and discontinuous movements. And Mike Green is someone who I credit, I think most people would credit as having really painted that picture for for me on this show, actually before that in private conversations, but we did an episode with him back, I think it was 114. And I think that that's right. That theory is correct, his theory around passive. But who knows where that limit is in terms of the amount of money allocated to passive that makes the entire model unworkable at scale. Yeah, there are very few guys. I've actually had Mike on our show too. He's kind enough to come on. And I think that there are very few guys. Everybody in this industry has an opinion and they are more than happy to tell you about it, right? Regardless of what their track record is. A lot of times they won't tell you what their track record is. Mike is a guy that has really changed the way that I think. And I can't say that for a lot of people because what happened was you're watching this market move in a mechanical value agnostic way and so rhythmic and so consistent. And it just reminded me of being on like, you know, the roller coaster, the tick, 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 you know, mm. as you move higher, just that rhythm. Mm. And I, I, you know, I've been around markets enough to go, what is happening here? Right. This is, you know, not chicken little, oh my gosh, this is all screwed up, but just, this isn't the way markets behave. And when I started reading Mike's research, I went, that it just fits. It just makes mm. sense, answers all of those questions. Then you look at the underlying data and you see what a giant percentage that passive is. And I think anybody not talking about this, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, the fact that the talking heads on CNBC never talk about this phenomenon, the way it impacts pricing. You know, I mean, you look at a company like Apple, right? Their growth rate has collapsed. The CEO has effectively admitted that they're an ex-growth company, which, you know what, honestly, a tip of the cap to him because he's not trying to hype it. But, you know, this is a company that was growing at 15 to 25% a year for basically 15, 17 years, right? And that whole time they're looking at that, they had a very tight value range. They're trading at like 16 to 20 times earnings in that entire run up. Their growth collapses, their margins starting to get squeezed four straight quarters in a row of declining revenues and declining profits. And that's when their multiple goes through the roof. You know, we're sitting there today looking at a 31 times earnings. In the last 12 months, the multiples expanded by 50%, despite the fact their growth has collapsed and the risk-free rates up, you know, what, 200, 250 basis points over that period. And what is the story that markets are telling to justify that movement? I don't even know that they're really- post I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I can't, I don't even really hear people addressing it. I just hear the recent story is, and you and I have spoken about this a lot offline, but, you know, everybody's assigning the narrative after the fact, and it's hilarious watching these guys. And look, I'll just stand up and tell you what I think. If I'm wrong, I've got no problem eating it. I've been wrong plenty of times. But it's sort of like these 11% earnings acceleration next year. The only piece of data that points to that is the market action. I mean, look, and I'm not saying data can't give you head fakes or anything. I mean, we have tortured the numbers. We have been digging into the, yeah, there's this narrative of an earnings explosion next year. And I just, I just don't see it. But I also, you know, I also look at a company like Apple and Tim Cook, like I said, basically said, we're an X growth company. So I don't even know that you need the narrative anymore. You know, just, it's a great company. Kramer said, own it, don't trade it. You know, I, mean, I think I think that's where you're at. And Apple is a great company, right? But 
who wants to pay 31 times earnings for a yeah. company that's X growth? That reminds me of a conversation that I had with Howard Marks. That would have been episode, I think, 63. And he was talking about his first summer job working in the investment research department of Citibank, I think, in the late 60s, where the bank at the time bought the stocks of the Nifty 50, the 50 best and fastest growing companies in America, under the premise that nothing could go wrong with these companies because they were bulletproof and that the price you you paid didn't really matter because they were such great companies that they would eventually grow into their valuation. That was the thinking. The official dictum at the time, I think, was that there's no no such thing as a price too high. I think that's what it was. And yet, the day that Marx arrived at the bank, if you bought those stocks and you held them for five or six years, you'd have lost almost all your money in what were supposedly the best companies in America. The point being was to say that, yeah, you can buy great companies all day and still lose money if you buy them when they're expensive and sell them when they're cheap. That price, in other words, matters. That was the sort of takeaway from the conversation. Yeah. Now, I, I think that I don't think I know, and I meaning this market has clearly forgotten that, and for good reason, because it really hasn't mattered for a long time. I mean, you're looking at you know, I really thought that the pain trade of tech up and value down was over. It's not. It's in a new extreme. Yeah, hey, I'm with you right there too, right? I mean, so that, just to say something, because then I want you to, t I want to actually ask you a larger question about kind of where you think we are, what the path has been, because it's been a little bit over a month since we did an episode on markets on this show. And in fact, you were supposed to come on right after Andy Constant and Mike Green came on for their episode, which was at the peak of the bond market, of bond yields. And- we didn't end up doing it because of all the very unfortunate events that occurred in Israel. So another one of the explanations for why we're seeing this really weird disconnect between what we expected markets to be doing based on our theoretical understanding of the relationship between markets and the economy, another explanation, prevailing explanation for the past decade has been ZERP, has been very low interest rates, right? Yeah. You know, feel free to comment on that, but then tell me sort of where do you feel we are today? Because I also am with you. I didn't imagine that with a 500 basis point move in interest rates in such a rapid period of time that we wouldn't see more problems. I just, you know, I had a very simplistic relationship in my head between the cost of credit in a highly leveraged economy and what would happen to the economy and what would happen to asset markets over what period of time. And that just, if you had put a gun to my head two years ago, I would, I would have expected that we would have been in a recession by now and markets would have been lower. Yeah. No, I. so I'm with you. The one thing that I will say is to me, and I think that, again, for now, I think the data just is pointing in a very clear direction where the price action that you're seeing right now, in my opinion, actually makes some sense in a ZERP environment. And here's what I'm talking about. If you look at a Microsoft and an Apple right now, Okay, earnings yield on Microsoft stock trading at this level is, don't quote me, I haven't looked at it in the last couple of weeks, but it, it's somewhere right around 2.3, 2.5%. That's the earnings yield. Well, if you've got a 10-year yield at 1.8, that's a rich earnings yield for Apple, but I get it, right? Or excuse me, Microsoft. I mean, Apple's right around three. I get it. It makes some sense at 1.8. If you got a 10-year paying four and a half, you got a two-year paying 5.1, and I, and I just don't think people are thinking about this math, right? So let's take Microsoft. Let's say the earnings yield is 2.4. And again, don't quote me. Check it yourself. It's pretty easy to look at, but let's call it 2.4. So let's say they double that profit, which we're talking about a $3 trillion market cap company, right? Everybody goes, well, now they're talking about AI chips. And I go, okay, go assign 75% of the profit that NVIDIA is making off of AI chips Add it on to Microsoft and show me the difference it makes. I mean, it's a lot of money, right? But you're starting from such a, you know, you're dealing with the law of large numbers at this point. So let's say they double their profits over the next the next six years. Earnings yield at this price would be 4.8. You can still buy a two-year treasury, five point. It's obscene. And it, one of our things that we talked about in late 2021, when inflation started becoming apparent, now, I will say that I got this right. I never dreamed it would last this long. But one of our theories, we kind of told our clients, okay, buckle up. We believe this is the end of the cycle. We don't think this economy can withstand higher rates. And we're going to have a regime shift here. And so for all of 2022, we were long energy, short tech. 
had really solid outperformance, as you might guess. And we thought rates would continue to go higher. But we told our clients, we said, look, it's going to take a while because this market has been trained to do things for 15 years. And I don't think people appreciate how mm. long a time that is, right? That's one fifth the average lifespan. You've got people that came out of business school that that started as junior analysts that are now the portfolio manager or proprietor of a hedge fund managing multi-billions of dollars. And they got rich playing markets this way, mm. right? They're not just going to stop because rates went up. It's what they know, right? So there's the actual shift in the regime, and then there's the waiting for the legs to catch up and for behavior to follow. This market is still trading. If we're at zero percent rates and the Fed's buying assets, I think this market makes a lot of sense. And moreover, I think there are a lot of buys, especially on the tech side of things, which is crazy to say. But alas, rates aren't at zero. The Fed's not buying assets. And the market is still behaving as if they were. And now you're looking at this scenario where you're looking at 2.3% earnings yields on equity, right? With all of these geopolitical risks, economies around the world going into recession, all of our leading indic lagging indicators going the same way. There's also another funny disconnect here, right? It's all about America. You know, the rest of the world gets a cold doesn't necessarily mean America is going to get a cough. Well, the funny thing is, is everybody's flying to tech. Tech is actually more sensitive to overseas economic gyrations than the rest of our marketplace. 58% of tech earnings come from overseas. So you just watch the market ignoring, right? All of these facts that are not moving in its direction, and yet the price action doesn't follow suit. So I think you have several confluing, or there's another layer to this that I think is behavioral and it's more a reflection of culture at this point. And overactive central banks and record fiscal, and it's, I have used this, it's a term you quoted, and I think it describes so many things so perfectly, which is financial nihilism. And you you stir all this together, right? And you just have, this market that just doesn't care about fundamentals. Yeah. And I can show you example after example after example of great companies blowing out expectations, selling off Apple and, you know, these other companies not having great expectations. You know, like take a look at Netflix. Netflix's revenue growth, it's still a growth story and even though it's not growing. It doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. The growth rate over the last two years is like 6.5% for Netflix. They're approaching a 50x multiple. I mean, mm. you know, it's just madness. And I, so I think that it's kind of this confluence of events, right? It's this, this glut of spending that we've seen come from central banks and fiscal from governments, the muscle memory that's been built up for effectively 15 years of ZERP, Fed buying everything in sight. And it's just taken on this, a life of its own, man. It's Again, like it does. I mean, that's why I'm going to come at, at the same story about passive from a different angle, which is that the market has also become the preferred savings vehicle for people. So I think part of the, the issue also is that it's not really seen as a, a place where people are making discretionary investment decisions, but rather a place to systematically offload your money. And I think that also probably explains a big part of it. What, In order for this market to be right, what do you think would need to happen? Would, would it need to be a situation where inflation returns? We, get, we start getting double digit inflation so that equities, even though they're not maybe the best place to be, they still outperform bonds? Or actually, are people really expecting or would we require something like real growth, maybe driven by some kind of transformational economy wide effects of artificial intelligence or some other combination of technologies? The two paths forward we see here. And again, I think if you're just looking at PE ratios for a variety of different reasons, well, so well, let me speak to this for a second. If you're looking at traditional valuation metrics, just like a PE ratio to understand how overpriced this market is, I don't think you're going to see it. And I don't think it's telling the full story. You know, first of all, I think you've got a pretty highbrow audience, except for me. I'm the one renegade in there. <laughs> but right. we all know the at least for me, the hilarity of all these adjusted numbers, right? Everybody can come up with their own adjusted earnings earnings number. And we can magically go from, you know, negative $80 million cash flow on the quarter to 
an adjusted number of positive 53. So one of the things that we track are earnings as they're reported from corporations and then tax receipts, right? Because if you really want to know what a company's real earnings are, what did they pay income taxes on? Mm. The gap has never been wider in history. Okay. So I think that you have a scenario where earnings are materially overstated, some for fraudulent reasons, some just for it's, they can get away with it. So why not? Why not paint the, you know, do some window dressing there. But then you look at it, you know, market cap to GDP, price to sales, all these metrics, they're off the charts. So I think that there's two different things that can get the market on track. A, I'm not a proponent of the fact that I think that we're on the edge of a black hole and it's about we're about ready to fall into some generational morass and some giant collapse. I don't think it's 1929 redux. Having said that, I don't think it's not 1929 because of positive fundamental reasons. I don't think it's not 1929 predominantly because of the precedent that's been set by government and central banks. Okay, just... These people out there having the, their bare fantasies about an 85% drawdown, I'm kind of looking at them going, hey, guys, we just saw a quarter in 2020 where the economy dropped 23.5% on an annualized basis in a single quarter, and Fed activity made markets go up. Totally wild. No, it's such a great point. We just right. literally ran the experiment two years ago. Right. Take the hint. Okay. There is no natural economic force except the printing press breaking that will stop this cycle. So A, I think the setup is where this market gets right. I think you're going to have an extended period of time of very disappointing market returns for a whole lot of reasons. Or B, you have something like AI hit where you have a productivity shock, right? That You can't take that off the table. As a fundamental investor, that's a very unappetizing proposition for me to even say, because I think the valuations are ridiculous and I think they'll proven to be ridiculous. But you know, this I think of a conversation you and I were having yesterday, which is you cannot underestimate the pace of innovation that's happening right now. And as AI comes into the fore, that will accelerate. Now, I, I also think that the impact of AI, especially in the short run, at least financially speaking, is way overstated. It's going to take a while. It won't take as long as I think the internet just because we've done it before. But, you know, monetizing these things takes time. And I just think people are way overstating that. But I think those are really the two outcomes. I don't see a scenario because of central banks where you've got a collapse, but I do see a scenario where you have a very maybe downwards, slightly biased, or look at the trading range we've effectively been in for two years. We may stay here for a really long time. It doesn't feel like it right now, but it didn't the last time we were at these levels either, right? So, you know, NASDAQ just almost 40% ago, you know, it felt like the bottom was going to fall out of everything. That was, you know, shoot, that was like, what was that, 10 months ago? And you started threatened heading back there just a, a month and a half ago. So I look at this market and I think range bound over the longer period of time makes a lot of sense. But like I said, you know, maybe the market is looking forward. If we're not range bound, I think that there's only really two different propositions. It's got to be some explosion in productivity. Or I think the other thing that you have to entertain, in my opinion, and I think this is the least likely thing that will occur, but it is possible that the market is beginning to sniff out some higher form of inflation. I don't want to use the word hyperinflation because I, I truly don't believe hyperinflation is possible in the United States with the financial markets and financial systems built the way they are at this time. Eventually, is it possible? Of course. But maybe the market is sniffing out much higher rates of inflation. But those to me are really the only outcomes that make, that hold water. I mean, to justify valuations, especially at the top of these indexes, you got to have a productivity boom. Yeah. So I think that the changes we're going to experience from artificial intelligence are going to come much faster than what we experienced during the internet. And I think it was you and I that were talking about this. For example, I'm very optimistic about what it's going to do in terms of therapeutics and treatments and in medicine and science. And I think what we're going to start to see is kind of similarly, again, we'll just use the analogy of like disturbance in the force, like in markets. People aren't necessarily going to draw the connection between AI and what they're seeing, but they're going to start seeing announcements of breakthroughs that are happening in science and technology. And they're going to be happening more and they're going to be bigger than what they're accustomed to. And it's hard to know what impact that's going to have. It's also not 
easy, at least for the layperson to understand how to monetize that, because a lot of companies are going to be able to take advantage of AI that you may not necessarily immediately think of. I think the other thing about government spending is a good point, and it also brings us back to, again, just shows you, man, that even if you get the future right, you could still get the trade wrong. Oh. Y you know, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Look, look, I'll always shoot you straight. We had a really nice year last year, but we're bumping around. I think we're up like two, two and a half percent on the year. Mm. <laughs> and we really haven't stepped in it. It was just, we came through last year and we looked at this year and said, look, we think rates are going to go, go higher and the economy is going to slow down and we're going to stay conservatively positioned. I mean, economy hasn't slowed quite as much as we thought, but we've probably hit the fundamental side like 90%. And then there goes the NASDAQ and the S&P is up 20. And mm. that's all being driven by seven stocks. I mean, if you look at the median stock in the index, I think the median stock in the Russell right now is down 30%. Mm. That was something Mike Green pointed out recently too. So there certainly is a bifurcation and the market really isn't telling the real story. But I mean, there, that's a perfect example of getting the macro picture pretty much dead on the money and not having the right trade on. I just didn't think, you know, I've seen this market do a lot of incredible things. I did not think in this environment you'd see multiple expansion the way you have at the top with the discount rate going up. I didn't think, I mean, that just seemed too out there. And it's been amazing to watch. I mean, like I said, you Apple, four quarters of declining revenues, declining growth, discount rate up 250 basis points, something like that over the same period of time, multiple expands by 50%. You know, mathematically, that doesn't work, right? So it's something else. And that's exactly what we did. We got the fundamental case, I think, pretty much dead on the money. And Miss the trade. I mean, look, another example is uh, you could take both the war in Ukraine and you look at like oil and natural gas. I mean, oil and natural gas both popped initially, but declining subsequently. And then you look at the events in, in Israel-Palestine, which could absolutely drag in Iran. And after a short pop in the price of oil, we're down to like 74 today. So like, and I bring up the geopolitical stuff again in the context of like, you could get it, even if you got this prediction right, which no no one could predict something like that. Like you could say there's a, a higher likelihood of regional escalation in the Middle East, blah, blah, but you, you're not going to make a prediction about that. No one has a crystal ball. But like, even if you did, like, how the hell do you even monetize that? And I, that goes to a bigger question for you, Zach, which is like, or an observation, feel free to like comment around it, which is it feels like we're living increasingly in a world, the way I describe it, it feels like we're moving inexorably towards some major cataclysmic event, right? Like that is what's happening. It's like a funnel and we're moving more closer and closer to it. And the tails are getting fatter and fatter, but it's like, what do you do about yeah. that? So a couple anecdotal stories about this. And I think this goes back to, and when I say this you know, I, I know it's somewhat intellectually unappealing because it's a well-known thesis, at least to your audience. I think it goes back to passive. So at least now we can, the cultural side of it is different, but as far as the markets go, I think that what's happened is that active managers like myself have become an ever shrinking pile of market money. And so when we act on fundamental things or we respond to risk, generally speaking, we are the marginal transaction, right? We are not the main flow. We're the marginal transaction. And we're more marginal than we've ever been in history as a percentage of market flows and, and market assets. And so I think we can rock the boat hard initially. But that selling or that positioning or that buying wears out very quickly in relationship to the total overall flows. And so you'll see these initial readjustments or sharp drops or whatever, and then that ratchet process starts again because the passive flows then resume, right? And they keep going the whole time, but you kind of exhaust that marginal move, right, with that marginal transaction, and then boom, the passive takes over again. And I remember seeing this. This is very reminiscent to me of January of 2020. And the reason I bring that up is I did not know that there will be global pandemic shutdowns. Nobody knew the extent of it at that time, but we didn't need to. Okay, the most stunning thing, and this year has been pretty stunning, but it's right up there with this. People forget January 1 of 2020 to January 31st, the S&P was up 13%, running right into COVID, right? Just not caring. And people are like, well, who knew? And I remember like, that. I remember watching yeah. these videos on Twitter and being like, how are markets like not even pricing this in one way or the other. I think I might have even had Muhammad Elarian on during that time 
and I asked him about it, unless I'm thinking about it, I think it was around then. I think his response was that it's very hard for markets to price something like that for the same reason that it's very hard for them to price geopolitical risk. Well, no, and I disagree with him. I don't think it's difficult. I don't think markets are even trying anymore based off passive flows, meaning it's not hard. When you look at the valuation the S&P was trading at at that point, when you looked at vol at that point, we were buying vol in the middle of January sub-15. With all of this going on, this was after we heard 750 million people were effectively on house arrest in the country that is the manufacturing floor for the entire global economy. It's wild when you look back on it now, right? Yeah. Like it was like very obvious that something very bad was happening. Yeah. And we positioned for it. So I'm not, look, I'm not talking my own book, but we positioned for it. We, I didn't go short enough, ironically, but we got out of there with like 5% hits or something like that because we were long vol and long treasuries. And I'm sitting there looking at this going, then I called a buddy of mine that was managing the um, the supply chain for Microsoft at the time. I actually did a show on this. I put a show out and, and talked about this. And I said, I am talking to people at Microsoft that are telling me China is locked down. They can't get anything in. They can't get anything out. And from the horse's mouth, they're telling me that this is going to mess them up for more than a year, right? More than a year already at that point in January. And nobody cared. Nobody was asking the questions. And this has been, to me, a knock-on impact, an echo from 0809. But it's like a reverse echo because it's getting stronger as opposed to quieter as it travels, which is just this total risk anesthetic. People are just risk blind. They're just bulletproof. And it's because, the you know, for a lot of different reasons, but it's because central banks have been riding to the rescue. And if you look mm. at what central banks have done for the last 15 years, you know, people talk about the death of macro. It's not the death of macro. Central banks, I think one of the easiest ways to understand what they've done is their activities were all about muting natural macro forces. That's what they were trying to do, right? And they did because you can paper over macro forces, right? And so it just created this money flow machine where markets became liquidity gauges as opposed to price discovery mechanisms. And that's where we're at today. And it's gone on so far that market participants, as is often the case, get drunk on returns and haven't really noticed or taken heed to the fact that those flows, as it pertains to central banks, have largely been shut off. Money isn't a zero. But again, the reason I hearken back to January of 2020 is, in my opinion, people are doing with rates precisely what they were doing with COVID back then, just ignoring it and looking at price action and creating a narrative around price action as opposed to you know, figuring out what's going on and price action you know, following suit. So you asked a question earlier too about thought we'd be in recession. I, I think all that's coming. I just think the lag effects are much longer this time because of a couple reasons. The ability for people to term out their debt, except for the US Treasury, which is another, another discussion entirely. And I thought Druckenmiller's comments recently about Janet Yellen and not terming out the debt was spot on. What did he say? He just said, how is it that the person that we have hurt, hired to manage the treasury is the only American consumer that didn't realize it was a good time to term out their debt? He's like, the average guy at home knew it, lock in a 30-year fixed. And he goes, look at Janet. She had multiple years of being able to throw the long end out there for sub three, term that sucker out for a long time, maybe throw out some 50-year stuff, maybe even some 100-year stuff. I mean, it was Argentina. Right. That throughout the wasn't the it like year bond? Yeah, the hundred year bond. Right. And I remember laughing so hard at that time because everybody's it was oversubscribed, right? Money was flooding into that baby. That was for a company that had defaulted on their debt four times in the last hundred years. Right. So and you were signing up for a hundred year bond. And he just said it's the biggest joke in the world. If you go actually do the math on that, the fact that she didn't turn that debt out, we don't have to really point too far out into the future, but you know, conservatively speaking, I think that one lapse on her point or on her judgment alone there will probably cost the American taxpayer two to three trillion dollars over the next decade of just interest expense, just because you didn't take the time to turn out your debt. What are you seeing? What are the data points that you're seeing that are most concerning to you that suggest that markets expectations don't reflect where this economy is headed and discrepancies in the data as well? You know, I know you've talked a bit about corporate revenues versus what we know about GDP growth. 
what are the those kind of discrepancies? We also talk about inventory and how much of that might be coming out of inventory. So what is your view? Like, what is the story that you're sort of seeing? Yeah, so it is somewhat complicated when you're looking at price action. But one of the things that, and you have to listen to the market, right? You have to consider that. But if you just step back and look at the data, I think it's pretty conclusive. And I think if you're just looking at the data and you're not looking at the market, I think it's pretty hard to argue with. So for instance, there are data points out there that aren't horrible. And as a matter of fact, most of them aren't horrible. But what we are seeing is they're very synchronized, right? So everything seems to be doing this at the same time, right? Taking a decided turn south. And it makes all the sense in the world. I think the delay has been, there are always legs on monetary policy. Everybody forgets about that at every market turn. It always happens. And then when you look at the excess savings rate coming into this, in retrospect, I thought you'd be seeing what we're seeing in LEIs right now. I thought we'd be seeing that a year ago. But in retrospect, in hindsight, looking back, it makes sense because, again, the excess savings rate was insane, right? You had to burn through that. The animal spirits were loose. It was going to take time to rein that in. And, you know, and economies don't stop on a dime. So when you step back and you just start looking at everything, and I'm talking about temp hirings moving decidedly south, right? Everybody's talking about the jobless rate. We're looking at continued jobless claims because that's the precursor. Continued jobless claims are up to the point where whenever continued jobless claims have increased by this much, and I, I don't quote me, Chase has got all of our numbers, but I believe they're up about 13, 14%. Anytime they've crossed over 12, I believe is the line. You've had a recession 100% of the time. The unemployment rate is just below the line where if it goes up just a touch fraction more, it's going to be up 15% off its base. Recession 100% of the time. Go look at manufacturing PMIs. They are in recession territory right now, solidly. Then you go look at the economic data in relation to the consumer. It's a little bit bifurcated, meaning... 40 and over actually looks pretty good. Defaults are moving up, but not in an alarming way that would freak you out. You go look at the demographic of 40 and younger, default rates and delinquencies are spiking to levels that we haven't seen since 09 and 10. But the more alarming number, so I would say that delinquencies and default rates in the 40 and under crowd are at a red light level, right? There's something going on there, clearly. The alarming number, and I'm not sure exactly what that number is, but the alarming number is the size of the defaults and the delinquencies. This isn't a $500 credit card, right? These are big ticket items that people are defaulting on. And I think the reason that's important economically is it gives you the magnitude of the amount of financial stress. You got a bunch of 18 to 25 year olds that are, you know, late on their or delinquent on their $500 visa balance. I'm not as concerned, right? When you got 35 year olds that are delinquent on their $50,000 car loan, And that is spiking at levels that we haven't seen since the financial crisis. That's something to pay attention to. And one of the narratives out there, well, that's fine. You know, the baby boomers are going to carry it. That's nonsense. The amount of people in this country, you got 10 million more people in this country, 40 and under, than you do 40 and over. So if 40 and under is struggling, forget about your growth from here. You're not going to have it. And it's because you're coming from too high a point. So it's just very clear. The other thing is, I think that the Fed and I think policymakers really lucked out this year, and it it was luck. It's not conspiracy. It just so happened that 2023 was an extraordinarily light year for corporate issuance because just not a lot of stuff was coming to term this year. And same on commercial real estate. You've really been spared. You look at commercial real estate, especially office space, anything that's come up in office space. We said probably eight months ago, and I took some flack for it. We said you're going to see 60 to 70% write downs on commercial office space. And everybody's like, oh, you're a bear, perma bear, you know, all that kind of stuff. Go look at the numbers. That's exactly what we've seen. And it wasn't a prediction. It just, all you had to do is do the math, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's probably people not understanding the way commercial office space is valued. It's not valued like retail, it's valued strictly on a cash flow basis. What you can rent it for as opposed to what the property is actually worth. Is there an intrinsic value in the property? Of course. It's just not the way that loans and it's not the way it's financed. And it's not the way it's valued. So you're going to see that. I mean, go look at, you know, you can just go look at a schedule of loans on a lot of this commercial office space. You have a dearth of it hitting the market next year. Corporate issuances have to go up. A lot of stuff terming out next year. So 
you know, interest rates, Chase, my head of research always says this, interest rates don't matter until you have to pay them. And when people have that much cash, right, they don't have to pay them for now. Now you look at that excess savings rate, it's collapsing. It's down significantly. It's You're approaching back to where we were. And I think if you add in the higher cost of living, I can think you can make an easy argument that it's actually worse than it was pre-pandemic already. But, you know, that was kind of the thing. As soon as the sugar high wears off and that government cheese that we all got handed out, you know, is gone. The party can last till it's gone. And every single metric you're looking at, Lowe's came out yesterday. And it's funny because it, it not horrific results. I mean, same store sales are down 7.8%. That's another thing that cracks me up. I mean, you're looking at these retailers, right? Lowe's, Home Depot. I mean, there's tons of them across the board. And you read the minutes, you read the conference calls. It's like a carbon copy. They're all saying the exact same thing. Consumers slowing down, right? We're liquidating inventories. I think the liquidation of inventories was the biggest boom for GDP in the last quarter, not real economic activity. And I think you can see it, you know, we can get in that discussion, but if we're going to really believe the GDP numbers 4.9, that means 8% nominal. In a world of 8% nominal growth, how is it that so many companies miss revenue estimates? It just doesn't square, right? You're like, where it's got to come from somewhere. So literally all the leading economic indicators are just very, very consistent. Jobless claims haven't rolled over yet. They're moving in that direction, but very slowly. And, you know, I think there's a really good chance that you kind of see a cascade on the jobless claims. One of the theories we're working on, and I'm not married to it, but it appears to be happening right now, which is in the last four weeks, you can just see the data really deteriorating and across the board. You can see it even in TSA. So we, one of the things we track on the services sides is how many people are going through TSA checkpoints, right? That number has moved decidedly lower in the last month. Everything is lining up. That's so, an interesting data point. I never heard anyone cite that before. Well, TSA <laughs> checkpoints. If you if you're trying to be value and, and fundamentally minded in this market, you're you're digging pretty deep, right? At this point, so we're we're turning over every rock, but it's all conclusive. There are a couple of companies that are bucking it here and there, but they're all saying the same thing. The other thing is is just think about this. Let's just focus on three of them. If Apple, if Lowe's. And if Home Depot were all singing the same song, and even Costco to that extent, right? Costco, you don't see it in their revenue, but you go read the quarterly minutes that Costco's putting out. They were saying it six months ago. I remember they had a quarter back in summer where they came out and said, listen, the consumer is slowing down. They're switching from beef to canned chicken. It's happening. And I just think, again, I think the Fed has rode to the rescue so many times that everybody's kind of like, oh, you know, they hear bad news. It's a buying opportunity as opposed to, you know, putting some context around the market. So, I mean, that's what we're seeing just across the board. And you also know, like I was saying, with corporate expirate debt expiring next year, with commercial office space coming to term, looking at those loans. The rates equation is really going to hit harder. The cost of credit yeah. is going to play yeah. a bigger role. Well, and then, then the bull argument is, well, it's not going to hit hard because the Fed's going to cut rates. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about in the second hour. One, where do you think... What markets are pricing, what the forward rate structure looks like, and where you think rates are headed, what the year is going to look like. Also, the the point about the economic challenges that 40-year and younger old people are facing, I think also kind of gets into some indirect effects, which is the political risk associated with that, because that's where we see a lot of dissatisfaction among voters. We see that also among Democratic voters who are really dissatisfied. That pulls in a lot of factors, not just economics, also cultural differences. But I think that's also kind of really important to think about. Again, very difficult to price. But I do, I have uh, one of the areas where my view hasn't really changed in many years is that I do think where the future for us is going to be one where the government's going to be spending more and it's going to be finding ways to do that. And I don't think that an aging demographic is necessarily deflationary in this context because of all the outstanding government liabilities. But there are people that are take the other side of that, someone like Mike Green. But we did an episode several years ago with the former chief economist of the, of the Bank of England, Charles Goodhart, where he made that case. So we're going to talk about that in the second hour, Zach. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. 
If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Zach, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Zach, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. Sounds good. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.